a little bit tired, who, who may well show that they need a bit of nutrition there. So you look about six foot, six three. <laughs> so he's obviously going to weaken to blue, isn't he? Um, <laughs> So, um, let's go for, just test the strong indicator muscle here, first of all. Okay, and pull. And we go over there. Pull. So we're reaching for the green. We'll just make sure it's working all right. So he's green on one eye. And green on the other eye. So now let's, uh, if we can go back on the slide, uh, can you just click back on there? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you in the eye position to the left and up. Left and up. Left and up. So about three times to the left and up. And pull. And he goes weak in that position. That indicates he's got a deficiency of something. Now our issue is that we don't know what it is. Okay, so this is where the composites are very useful. Yes. So if I can have the composites, we have no idea except for the fact that he needs a nutrition. So the first composite, but there's no particular order to this, um, we're putting on uh, water-soluble vitamins. So these would be vitamin Bs and vitamin Cs, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to need him in weakness at this stage to see if he strengthens. So the vitamin or a nutrient is something which he needs and therefore it will change him from weakness to strength. Okay? So understand that. So if it's a nutrient, you have to start from weakness. Sorry? It's me. Do you want to go back to the something? No, that's, that's fine. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use the, the marker here from the green. Okay, so he's in weakness with the grain, and we're testing with water-soluble vitamins. Okay. Now, no one marker is 100% definitive. So you can't say, oh, 100% he doesn't need a vitamin B, but the likelihood is there's probably something which will come up easier. So now we look at minerals. So this would be minerals and mineral compounds. So they're not just metals, they're minerals, because you've got selenium in there and iodides, which are non-metals, but they are minerals. So it's cool. So he doesn't strengthen to those. So again, we can't say 100%, but the likelihood is... Unsaturated fat. Unsaturated fats. These mean that they're the unsaturated fats, usually omega-3 or omega-6. No. Coenzymes. Coenzymes, remember, are activated vitamin Bs, aren't they, mostly? Except alpha-lipoic. SAM, vitamin C, and the fourth one, CoQ10. Well done. Okay, and in fact, we've got a winner. Okay, so this is the CoQ10. We'll finish off the other ones just to make sure. Uh, sorry, it's coenzyme, not CoQ10. Yeah. Okay. Probiotic. Probiotic. So just to see there. And vitamin A, smart vitamin A. So we're going to do the fat soluble vitamins one at a time because. They don't work together. Smart D3. Smart D3. And smart vitamin E. And smart vitamin E. Okay. All right. So he shows to a coenzyme. Now we'll go through the box here and see which coenzyme. So before we start going through the coenzymes, Let's go for the popular ones, okay? Now, the most popular one we know is the one that we sell most of, okay? And, you know, in this business, we've sold most of this one over the last 20 years. And that one is pyridoxal 5-phosphate. So let's start off with the popular one. The liquid or the liquid? Well, have you got two of those? Yeah. Okay. Now, sometimes smart. That's a smart with um, P5P particularly, Sometimes people are better with a liquid and sometimes better with a capsule. I'm not quite sure why this is. So I like to test with both. Because sometimes one more person will strengthen to one and not the other. And sometimes they don't strengthen to either, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Now the next most popular one is adenosyl cobalamin. And it was the one of the active coenzymes of B12. 
So adenosyl cobalamin, four, and we've got a winner. <laughs> okay, so there's no point in going on any further. Let's do that one first. Okay, so now we get a, a glass. Have we got some adenosyl cobalamin down there? Now what we do is we'll pop the glass in the mouth. We hold the glass. And we'll check with adenosyl. Adenosyl and methyl look the same. And hydroxycobalamin, they all look like, thank you, like dental mouthwash. <laughs> Stain? A little bit, yeah. Uh, but they're a bright red. And if we depress the, people say, well, how do you dose it? So we empty the pipette, okay, make sure there's nothing in there. Squeeze the rubber, okay. Put, so you'll notice that's real rubber and not um, uh, silicon, which are very difficult to get the same amount of drops. So that's real rubber. So you squeeze it, put it in, and let it go. And that will take you up exactly 12 drops. Okay? So you get 12 drops. That's a squirt. It's an official squirt. So one squirt equals 12 drops. Two squirts. You notice I'm keeping the uh, the bottle away from the patient and the table uh, because if he kicks it, he's going to drop it and the hotel will not be pleased with a big red stain on their carpet. Always do that with B12 and always do that with the iodine. You know, mm -hmm. once you've spilt the iodine, that's it. You must just throw the article away. So that's four squirts. Four. You see, he needs a good dose, doesn't he? He's looking at many, many thousands of times the recommended daily allowance of B12. Now, there could be another reason for this. So, A, with a coenzyme, it may be that he can't make enough for him to recycle it enough. Or B, somebody else is getting it. So, he's five squirts to strengthen him up. Is it a good product? So, let's see. Let's ask the body clock. Perfect. So that's good. How often should he take it? So we go on to stomach. Nice and strong. Go on to his small intestine. Weak. Go on to dinner time, circulation sex. Weak. Now why is it only once a day? And why is it stomach time? Because at stomach time we have high hydrochloric acid. Do you need high hydrochloric acid to absorb vitamin B12? In, in a funny way you do, and you don't. So no and yes is the answer to that. Why do we need it? Because hydrochloric acid is produced in the oxyntic or parietal cells which also produce the intrinsic factor, which you do need to absorb, which is a, a, a protein substance, which bonds onto the adenosyl cobalamin and absorbs it further down in the intestine, in the small intestine, and takes it across the border from the small intestine into the blood. Okay? So it's not actually the hydrochloric acid you need, it's the, hydrochloric, it's the intrinsic factor that you need, the peptide, which is secreted at the same time as the hydrochloric acid. So you need one without the other. So therefore, if you don't secrete hydrochloric acid, you're not going to secrete intrinsic factor, and then you'll get really chronically low. And why do you not secrete hydrochloric acid? Maybe you're deficient in zinc, right? Because zinc is necessary to make hydrochloric acid by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. And that may be inhibited because of a toxic metal. Okay. So you see how it's a chain of events, isn't it? What Jeff Bland says, the web of interacting relationships, which possibly... You know, we are one of the few professions, we won't say the other one, to be able to actually see this web mm -hmm. and to stand back and say, well, he needs B12, and we give him B12, but it may be for a reason a little bit remote of what he's just deficient in. Okay? Um, now, there's only one good food for B12, and that is red meat. Okay? Doesn't matter what a vegetarian says, it is red meat, okay? and not just meat and particularly not chicken, because chicken is white meat, there's no B12 in it. So it's red meat, okay? And red meat, the best forms of red meat is wild meat. Okay, and wild means 
birds, okay, boar, deer, all these sort of things, rabbit, anything that comes in your garden. <laughs> sounds, sounds good, he says. Okay. Uh, the nearest of their most commercially available is, is lamb or sheep, because sheep and, uh, are out on the fields and they don't spray them really most of the time because they eat anything sheep and they're on hillsides and things. So lamb is pretty much or, as organic and wild as you, as you can get most of the time. So most of the people, that's fine. But of course it is a problem with a vegetarian who's a strict vegetarian who won't eat meat for whatever reason. And of course they've got to take the B12. If they don't, and they are deficient in the B12, either ordinary B12, methyl or adenosyl, they'll go downhill. And they're extremely difficult to treat. Because if you've got a vegetarian who's B12 deficient, they have all sorts of problems. And especially if they're a green or a red. If they're a blue, they're naturally more vegetarian-minded. But if they're a green, then worst of all, if they're a red, because reds should be carnivores. And if you've got a red who's a vegetarian, then you'll have a real problem on your hands. So there could be a number of reasons why he's deficient in adenosine at the bone, but we need to put him on this for how long? One month. Okay. Now, B12 will build up, and the red cells will replace each other at a rate of about a quarter every month. So a red cell lives for four months in total. It takes a month to mature from the bone marrow, which means in a month's time, he will have a quarter of new blood cells. In two months' time, he will have half, 50% blood, new blood cells. In three months' time, he will have three quarters. And in four months, he will be, have new blood cells altogether. Right? So what that works out mathematically is he can actually halve the dose in one month's time. Halve it again a month after that, and then halve it again for the last month. So we said five, so you halve it to two and a half, to one and a quarter, and then say one squirt until at the end. Now, if you come on the next seminar, which will be on in July, we would expect you now to show in uh, or, uh, uh, 25th of May, June. Yes, we, we, he should be down to about one squirt. So he should have done two, two and a half months on, on the B12. All right? Now, we know that that's where we know he needs it at the summer time. We know it's the perfect one. Is there anything else in the department of nutrition? That's the big question. Does he need anything else? He's got his B12. Does he need some magnesium or zinc or something else? Question. Let's take him back. Okay. So he's in there. Now follow my finger. Hup. 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 And up. Pull. And he stayed strong. Had he gone back into weakness, it would have been an indication of something else because I haven't closed that sort of department on him. So because he stayed strong, we know that that particular department indicating there's a nutritional deficiency is clear. Right? So off you go. You take that with you. Uh, you can actually drink it neat. It has no taste. People think it's going to be like dental mouthwash, but it actually has no taste at all. Um, now you've got an ATP there, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. OK, so the same thing applies there with all nutrients. All nutrients work from weakness to strength. And you can use the colours to weaken them. You can use the definitive meridian, a therapy localization. As long as you start from weakness, that's the important thing to see if a person strengthened. And then you identify what it is using the composites. Then you identify the specific nutrient from the kit. And then you work out the dose when you've got the product. And then when you give it. Okay. So we did that, all that um, precisely there. Now, the next person we need is somebody who's tired. Okay, off you go. Okay. You're not going to be treated, but <laughs> which is what he hopes. <laughs> so a person who's tired means basically they're not making enough energy. And when we equate somebody with their energy, energy equates with health. So if a person calibrates at, let's say, 70% in their health, you find that when you calibrate the energy, it's also 70%. And in other words, health, energy, and life energy, or life force, is all the same thing. It's all to do with energy. And don't think of energy as just a battery. Think of energy as being something which um, is measurable, but it's not just one thing. It's not just heat, and it's not just light, and it's not just chemical. It's all together. All that energy package is together. 
And you know, we don't store energy. People think, I have no vitality, I have no reserve, I have no stamina. That's not the case, okay? You just can't make energy in the first place, and they run out of energy because we don't store it. Okay? We use energy, we make energy and we use it thousands of times a second in our mitochondria, and we make it to our demand. When we need energy, we make it. When we don't need energy, we don't make so much. We make energy at night time when we're asleep, but obviously in low overdrive, we, we take, make very small amounts of it. So let's see um, where we are here. So pull your knee to your shoulder. Do you play sports? Yeah. What? Martial arts. Martial arts. Watching you. I was, was going <laughs> to say, he's got strong legs, now I know why. Okay. All right, pull. So he's green, green, you're quite tall. How tall are you? Six one. Six one. Okay, so he's green, green. Excellent. Now, if he's tired and our energy bond, what we make is simply we have like a battery, like a, uh, a rechargeable battery, and we charge it, discharge it, charge it, discharge it, charge it, discharge it. Hundreds, if not thousands of times a second in every mitochondria in every cell. Now, some cells in the body, and we have 50 plus trillion cells, some cells in the body have one mitochondria, one powerhouse. But where we use most energy, we have a lot. So in the muscle tissue, we have up to 2,000, 2,000 mitochondria in every cell. That's a lot. And in the neurons in the brain, we have up to 5,000. 5,000 mitochondria, which is a lot of mitochondria, isn't it? Because we're, they use a lot of energy. They use more energy than any other tissue in the body. So when a person is tired, officially, where do you see it first? In the organs that use most energy. Okay? So that would be in the brain. So what you'd find is the person feels tired in their brain. It's called brain fog and various others, you know, sort of problems. And we need to make energy, we need two things. We need all the nutrients to make the ATP, and we need the oxygen to burn it. So it's like the furnace. It's no good putting all the coal in the furnace if there's no air. We shut the damper down, so you've got to have the air in there. If you don't have the air in there, the fire can't burn, it can't draw, you see? So those are the two components. So you could be short of the nutrient, or you could be short of oxygen. That's the ultimate challenge, if you like. You need both of those. Okay, so now, to get the ATP, we need to see uh, whether he's making ATP. So simply, let's do ATP. Now, in the mitochondria, it does not make ATP. The substance that is made in the mitochondria is called magnesium ATP. It is magnesium ATP. If you test a person with ATP, adenosyl triphosphate, this is a substance which is made as a donor of adenosyl and phosphate groups. It's totally different. It doesn't have the magnesium bond holding the two, the three phosphates together which is what happens in the mitochondria. So the, technically the most important substance to test for energy is magnesium ATP. So let's start him off in weakness, which we'll do simply in the easiest way here with the green, but we could use the definitive point, we could use the therapy localization. So magnesium ATP. So that would be the starting substance. If he strengthens, which most people do, he hasn't got enough ATP. Okay? So it's not a matter of him not having the storage because you don't store energy. You make it to demand. Right? If you don't make ATP at all, for some reason, in other words, you swallow cyanide or something, you have roughly four seconds. And that's it. It's quick, isn't it? Four seconds. Everything just <laughs> collapses. Okay? You don't have minutes or hours of energy left as those batteries discharge. It doesn't work like that. It just stops. Everything stops because we make energy to demand. Okay, so if we discharge the ATP, it discharges and loses its phosphate group, which is, has the like, extra uh, charge on it, if you like, the electron, to ADP, adenosyl diphosphate. So adenosyl diphosphate, if you imagine, is like a discharged battery. ATP is like a charged one, and ADP is like a discharge. So if you put ADP on him from strength, right, 
So ADP is the substrate for making ATP, isn't it? And what happens to a substrate if the equation in between doesn't work properly? You get a buildup of the substrate, which makes a strong muscle go weak. So he weakens the ADP, and he strengthens the ATP. Got it? He is tired. He's right. You're tired. We agree. Okay, perfect. So what do we do about it? Well, we can go off that point with ADP and do the eye positions and see what he needs. Or we could have started with the color, or we could start with the definitive meridian and so on. Same procedure. Always, always the same. Go through the eye positions and see what comes up. And I can't tell you why you're tired. Maybe you're having too many late nights. Maybe you're enjoying life too much. But it might be something more fundamentally. It could be deficient in magnesium or the B complexes and so on. Um, so let's say we could work with just the magnesium ADP. So we could the composites on it. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at a couple of composites. Water soluble. Vitamins. Water soluble vitamins. So this is a mixture of the B's and the C. Okay, so he strengthens for that. So give me a B complex. Now B complex is a mixture of all the B's. And as we saw, all the B's basically are involved with the energy pathway. And they work together as a family. Okay. Now each one has its own job in that pathway. Some we saw were in the Krebs cycle, some in glycolysis. Some are involved with burning proteins or amino acids in there. Some are involved with getting oxygen into the cell. But the B's are all involved in there. So sometimes a complex shows up and the individual ones do or don't. So let's try B complex there. So he strengthens the B complex. The B complex is a lovely broad spectrum, all the Bs, and he may show to that and not the individual ones. So let's see if it's the best product. How do I know whether it's the best substance for us? Go to the definitive point or the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus, and he stays strong. So it's excellent. Do we have some B complex? I think we do have it here, don't we? Do we? Oh, do we have some B complex? Now, you might be amazed just how much he needs, and he might be amazed how much he needs also. So what I've got here is I've got the, the magnesium ADP on him, because that's why he's in, he's in weakness there. And uh, it's a, can we have the capsule? Sorry, do we have capsules there? Because that's a capsule. Capsule, capsule yeah. Because we're using the capsules in the starter kit. So we're trying to conform, you know, with what's in the kit. Uh, so B complex, thank you. So one in the glass for him, two in the glass for him, three in the glass for him. So he needs three capsules. And how often does he need it? Or when does he need it, first of all? Okay, same thing, stomach, that's breakfast time, that's 8 till 10, good time, okay. Small intestine, follow me. Small intestine, small intestine is now 2 o'clock, isn't it, till 4, so it's a late lunch for you, right? No 1 till 2 anymore, okay. So it doesn't matter anyway, so it doesn't, doesn't strengthen there. Okay, and circulation sex is 8 till 10 in the evening now, and that's the second time. So you need three capsules twice a day. It's a good day. It's, it sounds a lot, uh, and it is a lot. <laughs> and you need a lot. Okay. And what you'll find is it'll start to really pick you up, because you'll need at certain times of the day, you'll need a bit more B6, and another time a bit more B12, and so on. So I can't tell you whether that's the, the only thing he needs, but what we do know is B complex works really well with him. Right? You can go back with those, you swallow them now if you want, but they will work better, of course, because you'll absorb them better at that particular time. Okay, that's that one. Um, oxygen now. Yeah, so we need, we're going to do now oxygen. Um, so I'm looking around for somebody who's yawning. Can you believe anybody will be yawning at the end of Saturday at 5 o'clock here? After such a stimulating day, nobody's. Uh, yes, you're yawning. Come on now. How tall are you? 
Five two. Ooh, so what colour is she gonna be? Probably blue. She doesn't look a blue, does she, or does she look a blue? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Just show, can you stick your hands up? You are blue. That's it. You should be at the at your height. But sometimes you get a short red. You'll see if she's a short red. Because it, the fingers are not classically blue, but they're not long enough to be a red either. So, hard okay. time. So the simple test for hypoxia, or lack of oxygen. This does not mean necessarily she's not breathing properly. When you say that, people will say, oh, does it mean I'm not breathing properly? And it may be that they're not getting the oxygen in, but oxygen's got to go from the lungs here into the blood, from the blood, round through the circulation to where it's needed, in other words, where the <coughs> mitochondria are, out of the blood, across the cell membrane, across the mitochondrial membrane, and eventually end up in the mitochondrial, between the, by the mitochondrial membrane, where the electron transport process occurs. This is why a person who's got hypoxia, so we're going to test, is there's only one substance to test for a low level of oxygen, and that's oxygen, isn't it? So we use O2. And she strengthens to O2. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the eye position to O2? Is up and down. So follow my finger up and down. So not too fast. Just up and down, up and down, up and down. We'll be doing this in more detail in film in film four. So, so she goes weak to the up and down. So that confirms the hypoxia. So she is deficient in oxygen. Now we used for a long time. We used a um, oximeters. You know, I'm sure a lot of you have it. And you can see that most people are 88, 89, sometimes 87. You know, I've occasionally dropped to 96, not 80, sorry, 96, 97, 98. Um, and other people come in with acute hypoxia, they're yawning all over the place, and they show like 98 or 99 on the machine. And you think, why is that? And the answer is, of course, you're measuring the blood, which is what the degree is, is in there, on the nail, isn't it? That's not where the oxygen works. The oxygen does not work in the blood. The oxygen is transported in the blood. Okay? The place it works is in the mitochondria in the cell, which is far too small for you to know. So it's got to get from the blood across the cell membrane of the red cell, across the cell membranes of the blood capillary, and across from there into the extracellular space, and across the cell membrane of the cell, and then into the mitochondrial membrane. That's a lot of membranes it's got to have. And the only thing that pushes it across is by diffusion, by the greater pressure of the oxygen pressure in the red cell than the pressure of the oxygen inside the cell itself where it's required. So it goes by diffusion. That's where the hypoxia is. This is why the person yawns, has a buildup of carbon dioxide, tries to get more air into their system. The hypoxia is in the cell. It's a measurement of cellular hypoxia, not necessarily you know, respiratory ventilation in the lung. It's respiration in the actual cell itself. Right? So that's hypoxia. Now, we'll do that in film four uh, and go right through because we've got to look at from the getting the oxygen into the lungs, the physical capacity to open the lungs up. We've got to look at hemoglobin in detail, how the body makes hemoglobin and how it carries the oxygen through. And then we've got to look in the energy pathway itself at the mitochondria and the different ways that we make energy and that very important mitochondrial membrane, which is where the oxygen goes to complex four, where we actually burn the oxygen to make the energy on the, on the ATP. All right? So, sorry, you've got to come back in three months, or two and a half months, but you are, you are short of oxygen. And I would get that sorted out before I get it looked at and get yourself running. Because what sort of things um, would you expect, first of all, about oxygen? What sort of things to, to think about? What? Yeah, no, I was thinking of nutrients, uh, memory loss, is right. Anything with mem anything with brain functions, yeah. B B1, yes. Oh, it's all on there. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, yes. I, I'd say B12 myself. B12, iron, of course, magnesium, zinc, C, and, and maybe so other things <laughs> as well. Now, let's pretend she's a goldfish. Now let's pretend she's a goldfish. 
Uh, you know, fish get their oxygen from the water, from the sea, by swimming around. And, you know, it's hard for us to believe, but there's a lot of oxygen in water, as long as the water's moving. The oceans are full of oxygen because of all the splashing and everything around. But if you have still ox still water, still water loses the oxygen. Isn't that Emma? Okay. So you're a fish in a fish tank. Okay, what do you do if you've got fish in a fish tank? You have an aerator in there, which means a, uh, a bubbler of air through a stone, usually a porous stone, which sends out little bubbles of air, very small that get dissolved in the water. Huh? And your owner goes away for the weekend <laughs> and forgets to switch the aerator on or turns it off by mistake, which is what happens. When the owners come back, which is usually the, the children of the family, because they're the only ones who want fish, usually. And to their surprise, the fish is on its side, or even upside down. Isn't that interesting? Good. Um, when that happened, when I was a boy, we didn't even have those uh, air races. We had one fish in a tank, and that was it. And we always wondered why they never lived very long, <laughs> which is obvious. My father was a great believer in a drop of cognac. <laughs> and so he gave a drop of cognac to the fish, which either resuscitated it or died on the spot. <laughs> uh, it did one or the other. But what we didn't know, of course, is what the fish was suffering from was lack of oxygen. And the point of what I'm trying to say is the area of the body that uses most energy and therefore most oxygen is the nervous system. Okay? And so the next question is, which part of the nervous system uses more oxygen? In other words, which part of the nervous system has the greatest density of neurons than anywhere else? The brain, yes, but what part of the brain? The cerebellum, right? Which controls the vestibular balance mechanisms of the body, which is why the fish, the first sign of the fish suffering lack of oxygen is it goes on its side and then goes upside down, okay? So if you just go on your side or upside down, we know, because that's what Elizabeth said, the first symptom is dizziness. And disorientation, uh, uh, you know, because you don't, you, you know, you get dizzy, unsettled in your brain because it just can't work because it's got the lack of oxygen. Okay, thank you. Have we got another one? Yep. We've got um, Manon oh, the Algehydra. Okay, yes. yeah. So we've got a couple more diagnostic markers here which are related to unsaturated fats. So there's ethane, and if this weakens in the clear, it means that you're deficient in unsaturated fatty acids. So it's a quick way to test if your patient needs fatty acids. And then we have manondialdehyde, which is a reactive aldehyde. But the point about it is that um, it's given off if you're going rancid, if you've got lots of lipid peroxidation, so you haven't got the right oils and the right antioxidants in your body. You will then weaken to manondialdehyde. And that's quite a serious condition, really, because your cell membranes won't be optimal and you won't be able to get the... Um, or the body chemicals in and out of the cell. So um, they're two good ones to test. And shall we have a demonstration? Yes. Yeah. What we'd need is somebody who's got a skin problem, uh, ideally. The skin is the same ectodermal tissue as the brain. So in the early formation of a child, the skin and the brain are from the same embryological tissue. Therefore, if you've got a skin problem, you've probably got a brain problem. The same. Okay? So you've got a dry skin, you've probably got a dry brain. If you've got a wet skin, you've probably got a wet brain. So you've got a, a very dry skin. So down you come. So what we're looking for here is simply has she got um, a need for essential fatty acids? So the ethane is an indication that she's breaking down uh, fatty acids greater than she's replacing them. And this is cool, we took this one from the ethane breath test, which is a standard breath test that if the breath shows ethane in it, it indicates the person's low in unsaturated fatty acids. And they use it as a diagnostic tool for dyslexia. And they found that children who show positive for the ethane breath test would respond to omega-3 or other oils, um, and then the ethane would disappear because they'd build it up. So it's an indication you've got an excess breakdown of unsaturated fatty acids, not saturated ones. Okay, so if we've got the ethane, so it doesn't indicate only omega three. So you've got to bear it in mind it could be the omega six or possibly even omega nine. Let's just test you that you're strong. 
Oh. So she weakens to ethane. Now, if the cell membranes uh, have also gone rancid in that process and need to be replaced, um, rancidity or peroxidation and so on will give us their end product malondaldehyde, which we now test, which means basically she's gone, or parts of her body have gone rancid, and the most important areas with these unsaturated oils is, of course, the brain. So if your skin is dry and you show positive ethane and malondaldehyde, we need to oil you up. <laughs> okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to give her an oil. So um, what are you, please? Yes. So what oil do we not give her? Fish oil. Okay. Mm -hmm. Have you got an omega-3 there? Uh, a, a super omega-3. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is a fish oil. This is omega-3 mm -hmm. fish oil. Let's just demonstrate that for you. And she doesn't strengthen. Now what we do is we leave the omega-3 on and see what she does from strength with it. Okay. She weakens. Huh? She weakens because it's probably high in mercury. Now, for a green person, it's not so significant, or a red person. But for a blue, remember, it's like a magnet, the, uh, the mercury. It's a toxin. So she shouldn't touch fish oil. Fish is fine, okay? It's the concentration, because the mercury does not kill the fish. Okay? It can't get rid of it, so it stores it. And where do we store toxins, we said this morning? Well, you can't get rid of them in the fat. And the fat in a fish is a liquid. Okay, so it's the omega-3 have very low melting points. So most of the fish oil is all liquid in the body, and so it stores it in that. So we don't use omega-3, and best even not to think about it. <laughs> so flax is the best to answer, first of all. So let's try, if it's an omega-3, let's try her with flax. So that works well. What else have you got in the box there? Uh, we've got walnut. Walnut, lovely one. Pumpkin. Pumpkin seed. Try the blue. Yep. Try the blue oil, which is a combination of oils with the flax pumpkin and walnut. Okay, what else we got in there as far as omega 6? Omega 6. Omega 6. Omega 6. Yep. So we'll try on the omega 6. I've never yet found a man strengthened through evening primrose oil. Anybody else? Something strange of a man strengthening to even primrose. Right? <laughs> borage, yes, borage is very common with skin problems. You've got the smart thinking. We could do a smart thinking oil. That's rich in the DHA, of course, or helps the body to make the DHA. So we've got the one which is the flax. And so what we know is that strengthens. How do we know that that's the best oil for her? Take it for the, that's it, for the. Um, uh, that's it. Super charismatic nucleus. She holds very well. When should she take it? Now, let's try breakfast time. Nothing like a spoonful of flax for breakfast. No. Okay. So, let's go for small intestine time. No. And let's go for circulation sex or supper time. Yeah. Okay. And why is that? Why do we take oils in the evening time with the evening meal because that's the cycle when lipase is highest. Okay, Lipase is the digestive enzyme that we use to uh, break our fatty acids down into single fatty acids so we can absorb them. Right? How much does she need? Well, what we do is we put it on a spoon usually. If you're not sure and you haven't got any flaxseed in, in your clinic, um, use a tablespoon or a dessert spoon. But otherwise, you can put a teaspoon into the glass in the way that I did. My advice is not to then put that back in the bottle, because the more often you do that, that flaxseed will go rancid. And flax is very unstable in the presence of oxygen, light, and heat. All oils are, which is why, of course, we keep our, all our oils and products as much as we can in mirror on glass, because you don't get the light through, but you're still going to get oxygen every time you take it out and put it back. So your oils will gradually get rancid, and then they won't test anymore. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so flax is the answer to stop you getting so rancid. <laughs> okay, now we've got another we've got couple of things to test. Yeah, we? we've just got homocysteine. Right, we've got homocysteine. So yeah. has, what we want is a red person. 
person, red person, somebody who's red, yes, let's take Jana. So a red person has usually the APOE4 gene and a tendency to high homocysteine. So let's see if you are red first, okay. How tall are you? 5'4", ooh, so she could be a short red. So you're right. You should have grown a little bit more. Probably should have, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you, you were put into two tighter shoes and clothes. <laughs> okay, so homocysteine. Homocysteine means if she weakens, it means it's too high. And homocysteine weakens or breaks down collagen so it predisposes to certain collagen problems, um, which may lead to intervertebral disc problems, um, articular joint problems. So we've got a positive there. We've got a homocysteine formula there. Yeah. So the homocysteine formula is mainly the nutrients to help metabolize homocysteine mm -hmm. to convert it into cysteine. That's the normal way the body metabolizes homocysteine. So that's P5P, vitamin C, serine, which is the amino acid, are the most important things. So that works well, the homocysteine formula. It's very, very similar to the red um, multiple. Red multiple and homocysteine formula are very similar. It works well, the body says it works great. Uh, so that's a good, good start there. Now some people actually strengthen to homocysteine. Red people have a tendency to too high a level because they're not recycling it or most importantly is they're not making it down into, into cysteine, which is what they've got to do. So they need the P5P, the vitamin C, the serine with the beetroot and things. Some people, on the other hand, need to recycle it to make more SAM, which is why we have this pathway in the first place, because it's the way we can continually to make S-adenosomethylene. And blue people are by nature deficient in methylation. They need to recycle and they will strengthen the homocysteine. They're actually low in homocysteine because they don't want to lose their homocysteine down to cysteine. They want to recycle it back to cysteine to make more SAM each time. So red people weaken to homocysteine, blue people strengthen to it. Should we demonstrate that with a blue? Could we just have you back again a minute because you were blue? Now you probably never thought about that, have you? You probably always thought, ooh, homocysteine, that's a bad guy. Yeah, stick around with me anyway. Okay, so let's go back with the blue. Okay, so you're weak to blue. Let's lift that one up there. Good. Okay, so we put the homocysteine, this is homocysteine, not the homocysteine formula on. Homocysteine pull, and you can see she strengthens the homocysteine. So you're low in homocysteine and she's high in it, right? So you need to recycle it, which is where other nutrients come in, like the B12 and the folic acids and things to get make more um, SAM. Okay, that's homocysteine. Homocysteine, yep. And then you have ty uh, tyramine. Tyramine, oh, okay. Oh, the right. So we have alpha-solanine, strength to weakness. So alpha-solanine is that deadly poison from the deadly nightshade foods. Um, so what we want is a green. Brian, we want a green. Tall man, the green giant. <laughs> so alpha solanine, please. Okay. Did you have potato at lunchtime? No. No. <laughs> you were too frightened, were you? Yes. <laughs> okay. Right, Paul. Let's just check that he's green still. He hasn't become a blue or a red. He hasn't become a vegetarian overnight. Okay, so green, and then what we'll do, let's pop up there, and what we've got is alpha solanine. Now, we probably don't have any green peppers on us, chilies, uh, potatoes, tomatoes, aubergines, but those would be the things I would now test. So I would test them one at a time, or samples of them in, a, in the kit, um, and to see which one he's sort of overloading with. Of those, which one do you eat the most? You try and avoid them all. And he's still weakening. When he's avoided them all um, to a level where he doesn't weaken, 
that's the level he should be. Okay. So the problem is, whatever it is, he's still too much. Okay. So that what that will do is it will paralyse or inhibit his acetylcholine, won't it? Okay. So what does acetylcholine do? It runs the neuromuscular junctions, the memory, the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay. Now, if it runs the neuromuscular junctions, what will happen now is he will not be able to hold his muscle very long. Now, the rectus femoris is the strongest muscle in the body, right? It should be. Okay. So what we're going to do, instead of the one to two seconds and then apply the extra pressure, is we're just going to get him to continue now to make the pressure to gain. So I'm going to hold you, so pull, 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 pull. He should last 10 to 15 seconds. He's gone in four. <laughs> pull. This is what we did to the foreign athletes, as I say, during the Olympics. Okay. Pull. If only Murray would know this with Federer uh, and Djokovic, he could win every match. He needs to feed them up with green potatoes before the match. Yeah. They'll all be exhausted on there. Okay, so you're a very living example, but you're still too high. If you're too high and you say, well, I haven't been eating any, we would give him lemon balm. Have you got some lemon, lemon balm, balm there? Okay. Just to prove this very issue, we'll pop some lemon, on, lemon balm on there. Lemon balm is not lemon. It's a herb. It's Melissa officialis. And what will happen with this is it doesn't matter if you're soaked with the citrix, right? So pull, 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 Okay. Let's try you on the other one. Pull, 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 Okay. Take the lemon balm away from him. Okay. This is why Jill mentioned it's good for the memory. Because it's good for the memory with people who've got low acetylcholine. Because they get low acetylcholine because of sawing. Pull, 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 pull. So you can see the difference. Okay. So lemon balm for you. Okay. Don't go away without at least one or two pots. Okay. 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 And now we've got tyramine. Food, tyramine. Oh, glutamine. Uh, glut glutamine, casein, and lactose. They are the sensitivities, uh, immunoglobulin reactions with casein and gluten. Lactose is not a an immunoglobulin reaction, it's just a sensitivity towards lactose. So I think you can <coughs> you can do those out um, uh, yourself. So let's do the, the last one. Tyramine. 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 So could we have the lady at the back with the blonde hair? Tyramine, do you want to put it up on there? Oh, tyramine, from strength to weakness indicates the sensitivity. You haven't got anything about tyramine? No, no, you're going to say it. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to say it. Oh, no, they've got the tyramine so food. What? Oh, got the tyramine food. You have. Why can't I say it? Oh, there they are. Yeah. They weren't there before. <laughs> okay, tyramine is an oxidized form of tyrosine, the amino acid. Okay, so it occurs in aged foods, which are rich in tyrosine. Tyrosine is an amino acid, so the older the food, and the more it's exposed to oxygen, the likelihood is it's going to get tyramine. And tyramine is such a toxic substance, and it's broken down by an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. And monoamine oxidase also breaks down serotonin, noradrenaline, and dopamine, and histamine. So if you've got a high level of, of tyramine, you, it takes that in priority over the other ones. So your level of noradrenaline and serotonin go up. And it's the high level of serotonin which constricts your arteries, but it dilates the mid-meningeal artery and the head, which is what causes the migraine. So when we talked earlier, why did we talk earlier? You were asking me lots of questions. The reason for it was you said... Um, you re she reacted to alcohol and wine. And she thought she got the sulfite oxidase pathway, which I thought, oh, good, I got somebody with a sulfite oxidase pathway. But then I realized it's aged. It's wines and things which are fermented. So we moved on. So one of the biggest sources is cheese, particularly aged cheese, you know, the hard cheeses and things. How are we doing with that one? You try not to eat them. Avocados and bananas. In the way that... Mm, my mother would never throw a banana away, you know, with the wartime and things, even if it was black. You could take her black bananas around. And she was a shocker because she suffered heavily with migraines because she would eat bananas when they're off because that was the wartime thing that we did that. 
They didn't have avocados, but you know with bananas when they start going brown? That's tyramine. Avocados when they go brown, don't touch them, particularly if you're a blue. Processed meat, anything which is yeast products, beers, wine, chocolate, okay. <laughs> sauerkraut, fermented soya products. Okay. So let's see, because I thought, aha, this might have been a sulfide oxide, but I think they're a tyramine. You can't tolerate soy, no. So she weakens to tyramine. So the one thing which you'll find with your migraine patients, okay, and there's a lot of those, is the vast majority of them weaken to tyramine. Okay, so look at it, because there's a lot of literature out there about tyramine, and tyramine is anything which is aged, sometimes just taking people off uh, cheese, and particularly aged cheese is enough, and they never get another migraine. Okay? Uh, my mum could have one glass of red wine, and she'd be in bed for days, you know, with the worst headache, and the angel of the migraine comes. <laughs> and it means you've got to go in a dark room and hide yourself away, and you get a really bad migraine, she said. And it is, it, it's hell to have a migraine, absolute hell. If we don't have a migraine, we can't imagine what it's like, what you go through. But occasionally you get a thump in the head, and you think, oh, I wonder if that's what people get with a migraine. But you imagine having that for days. You know, sometimes you know, the only answer is to be sick, isn't it? You need to be sick as soon as you possibly can. Fingers down the throat, salt water, anything. As long as you're sick, you start to get it up and get rid of some of it uh, is the best possible way. But we need to look, probably, because we can't necessarily antidote the tyramine. What we can say is amongst the foods uh -huh. is which one is it that is causing it. So is it cheese, avocados, bananas? Processed meat, yeast products, uh, chocolate. chocolate. You know chocolate. Do you keep off chocolate as much as possible? I yes. Don't, don't <laughs> you don't eat bananas, avocados. I like avocados. Yeah, the avocados would be an interesting one. Because even if they're not bruised, they've still got tyrosine. And especially if you cut them and leave them for a bit. You know, they go brown very quickly, don't they, if you cut them. Uh, and that's the tyramine building up. So, um, what is the position, let's say, with, let's do tyramine here. Tyramine is a chemical, so it's made inside from the foods that we have, or made inside the gut. So let's take you to the left, eyes to the left, eyes to the left. So let's see if she's showing up as a chemical, which it is, okay? Because we're cross-checking the tyramine, which is creating with it, into the chemical eye position. So let's take it to this way, which is an allergy or intolerance. So tyramine is definitely a chemical and not a food, if you like. It's, it's, a, it's a chemical reaction, really. So we need to find something which will antidote that for her, ASAP, really, when she's got a migraine. So I think, let's have a look at mm. NAC, shall we? Oh, NAC. Oh, you've got some things there? Yeah. Okay, so let's do, yeah. let's do NAC, because that gets rid of the chemicals, I'm thinking, okay? But that's a waste of time. So mm -hmm. let's look at uh, riboflavin 5-phosphate. So that's B2, that's a waste of time. Uh, smart magnesium. Smart magnesium. Mm. Pure for all things, <laughs> magnesium. That's a good one, I'll keep that one down here for her. Okay, zinc. Smart now, and P5P. P5P, capture. So P5P, no. So, so far, um, magnesium seems to work well. Mm -hmm. Let's see if that works well on here. So she stays strong with that. Let's leave the magnesium on and the uh, um, tyramine. Let's take you across here. So she stays strong, she doesn't go weak now, which is good. So if we left the, say, the magnesium on there in the clear. So press it in. I did about three times there. It negates it. So I think magnesium, magnesium a lot of times will clear my migraine very well. But you have to test. I can't tell you, because the next migraine patient you get may not show to magnesium. But you do, but I think what you need if, how often do you get them? Depends. I just do them, I should get them. I'm a 
Yes. Yeah. Okay, so how often would you get one, do you reckon, on average? Once a month. Once a month. Yeah. So I, th I would say you need to get somebody to go through you, go through all the chemistry there, and find out what's what. Um, because And how long does it last when you get one? can be up to three days, yes. Yeah. So magnesium will help. But it's even better not to have it, isn't it? Yeah. I find adenosyl cobalamin helps a lot of people you know, to get the oxygen levels up, and you need magnesium to activate adenosyl cobalamin, can be. Somebody was telling me the other day, molybdenum did it for them. They never had another migraine after they put on molybdenum, but I think that was because of the sulfates. Sulfate oxide. So every wind is a little bit individual, but the, the common characteristic to a migraine is dilation of the middle meningeal artery caused by high serotonin. So what you find on that particular time is that the kidney meridian will show positive to um, uh, to serotonin, high serotonin. You're not showing positive, so I guess you haven't got one at the moment. No. no. So when you get a migraine, <laughs> it'll go there. So you can have any other meridian, but when your meridian swings around to the kidney meridian, you're in trouble. Okay, because you know you're about to get a migraine. Swallow as much water as you can and some extra magnesium. Okay. Not that you'll know you've got that. Okay.